I did process. I mean, the word cancer has so much behind it. And I processed it to the point of like how they had to have it wrong. It, that couldn't have been me. So by processing, I was denying it. So to start, I didn't know anything was wrong. So about uh, January of 2020, I was doing a Pilates course. Now, as a student athlete, I know how to really work myself. And I was doing the most simple exercise. And I tweaked my hip, which I did just reference. I had some hip injuries in college. So really nothing was alarming. I was just like, well, I might have pulled something again. And I gave myself a lot of rest. So this hip injury of doing the Pilates manifested into growing from my hip down into my legs, into my calves. And it was just excruciating pain. I went to a physical therapist three times a week. And each time I went to visit, it progressed worse. And I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't over-exercising on it. And I felt so shameful that I was making such a big deal out of something that I couldn't pinpoint. And um, these symptoms just got worse. It went from lower extremities into upper extremities. It felt as if I was sore in every cell of my body. And it wasn't until it really manifested into my chest is that's when I became more alarmed on this could be something more serious. So I was in this exact room that I'm sitting in. One evening, I called my dad and I said, dad, I have chest pain. I've had two occasions of night sweats that were severe and I don't feel well. And he said, this is not a negotiable argument. Get into an Uber, you're going to the ER. Now, mind you, this was March of 2020 when COVID was rampant. It was just an emerging. So was our concern cancer? Absolutely not. Was our concern COVID? Yes. I went to the ER that evening. This was the first time I'd even been brought into a doctor's office and it was directly into the ER. That's where I got a CT scan. I got blood work. I was there by myself. Not a single friend or family member was there. And that night, if I could pinpoint the hardest night of my life, that night would be it because I knew something was so wrong and I had no one and no answers to help me figure it out. So <laughs> I'm not a big crier. I cried from 8 p.m. until 4 a.m. on stop, just sitting in the ER room, bawling my eyes out. The ER nurses had so many things on their plate with COVID happening. I was the least of their concerns and the CT scan and the blood work came back normal. Nothing showed any signs. Now, this is where it gets miracle. My dad, who is in oncology himself, he works for a company called Seattle Genetics, which sells a drug for classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. He had the wherewithal to say, things are not adding up. I am scheduling you for a biopsy the next morning, but I want you to be in Pennsylvania for this. So he picked me up from the NYU Langone ER at 6 a.m. after I'd spent the entire night in the ER, drove me directly down to Penn Medicine Abramson Oncology Center, and I got my biopsy the next morning. So I, for the first one, I did go under. Um, they took it from my back left pelvic region, which is where they saw some slight discoloration in my bone marrow, but um, no one was concerned. The actual ER doctors did not recommend me to get a biopsy. It was my dad's advocate or advocacy that <laughs> made me get it. And I was very frustrated with my dad at that moment. I didn't want to get one. I had just been in the ER all night crying. This was not a part of my plan. Um, and the biopsy obviously went super smoothly because I was under during that time. Now, the following biopsy that I had to get, I was not. 
and that was excruciating. So for the next couple of days, I went back to New York. I was walking to and from work. I was taking the subway. At that moment, no one was wearing masks either. So COVID was still everywhere. And yet I was, without knowing it, as immunocompromised as I possibly could have been. And I was going into a WeWork, which was where my office was, and going back and forth into what was probably one of the most um, scary times of my life, but I had no idea what was coming. And only five days later, I would come back into this exact room and I would get the call from my oncologist. I will never ever forget that moment. Um, I was looking outside my window and I was actually supposed to, I was walking home that evening. I had forgotten that my oncologist or this this person, I didn't even know he was an oncologist. I just thought a doctor was calling me. I forgot he was calling me that evening. And I had made plans to go to Trader Joe's and I had missed my block that I typically go. And if I didn't miss it, I would have gotten this call in Trader Joe's. <laughs> but something was looking out for me. I had gotten home. Again, no roommates were home at the, at the time. I saw a unknown number come up on my phone and I remembered, oh, I'm getting my call. And I remember answering it and hearing the hello. I knew something was wrong. And I had to patch in my parents on the other side and say, hold one minute. I'm calling my parents. I merged the call. I had my mom and dad, myself, and my doctor. And he said to me, we have found that your biopsy shows you have lymphoma, a form of cancer. And I put myself on mute. I sank to the floor and I screamed. I have no idea what was said after that moment. I completely blacked out from any conversations and I think the hardest part about that moment was hearing the despair from my parents, predominantly my mom who lost all control and to be so thrown off and set up that this could not be the case and then to have it be the case was the most difficult part of that entire journey. So I went in and the biopsy that I had gotten did disclose I had lymphoma and the PET scan did show I was stage four, but they did not know specifically what double markers I had. And that then determines the line of treatment. So I would have either gotten RCHOP or our EPOC, which is a little bit more intense of continuous chemotherapy. So the second biopsy had to go forth to enable us to know that decision. And I was not prepared for the biopsy. So when I went in, my oncologist was like, we need to do this right now. And I'm actually gonna do it myself and you're not going under. So they just numbed the area and he had to try four different times to actually um, extr extricate the bone marrow, which was, the most painful process. And this was the day that I found out I was stage four. So that day I had, I'd learned I was stage four. I was starting chemo, whatever line that would be in the next couple of days. And I also learned as a female that day, I was not able to freeze my eggs on top of getting my biopsy. So it was second worst day of my life, but um, definitely a, a, not a fun process. So after my biopsy, I, they did see that it, I didn't have a double marker. So um, RCHOP was definitely the first, um, going to be the first three chemotherapy treatments I went through. Now, after those first three, if I wasn't showing any improvement, I would then move on into our EPOC. But for the first kind of starting factor, this was the frontline form of treatment. 
And um, I didn't have much of a say on that, given it is a less intensive in terms of the amount and time length of chemotherapy infusion. I obviously wanted to start there instead of doing something more intensive. And uh, we had a MRI done on my brain as well. I, so once I got all of my, my MRI on my brain and um, the second biopsy, I was able to then start chemotherapy five days later without any issues. So after I was diagnosed, I did take a couple of weeks to digest the information. I would then go back to work during treatment one, two, and three. So I chose to have my infusion typically on a Thursday so that I could take off work Thursday, Friday, and have Saturday, Sunday to recover. But the day typically was arrive around 8 a.m. and get my labs done to ensure that all of my accounts were somewhat normal enough for me to actually receive the chemo. I would then go into my chair. It was usually like a beige kind of lounge chair me and it's a, just a line of other people. And as an adolescent slash mo, like young adult, um, it was I was the only young person in the room always. So that was just as difficult to see, but um, I would get my pre-medications, which typically were Benadryl and some Advil and some anti-nausea medication. And then I would start each line of RCHOP separately. So. Every single part either took about 45 to two hours, depending on the amount of volume of liquid. Each of them had their own complications with having an allergic reaction. So um, the oncology nurses always were by my side. And this was also during COVID. I had no one allowed in my chemo infusion rooms. So it was just me and the nurses for about eight hours of that day. So I started to feel the sensation of pain, like you just said, and it took about a week after my first treatment for me to feel this sensation. And I let my hair naturally fall out for about a week and a half before I decided to take control and shave it. So I very much did see the hair falling out in large clumps. Um, I would refrain from brushing just because of how much would come out. And I documented actually a lot of videos of me just talking about my experience and how it felt and actually showing the hair and being really vulnerable about the experience, but it allowed me a space to share the honest truth and have people see a side that for a lot of females, they either don't discuss because it's really hard or they're afraid or ashamed of it. And this really did allow me that safe space. Oh, it made me feel invincible. And I will say beauty and having the exterior part of a female's beauty is extremely difficult. And once that is taken, that identity is taken from you, um, you really rely on people to help validate that internally, not just externally, that you are loved, that you are worthy. And losing hair and losing that feminine aspect, what allowed me to get through that was the love and um, almost validation from hundreds, if not thousands of people saying, you are glowing with or without hair. And that type of inspiration from others allowed me to cultivate that inspiration for myself. After my first infusion and into my last, I would have about 72 hours of extreme nausea. This was pretty day consuming nausea. So I would wake up with it. I would maybe eat a few things here and there, but what I did know after my first treatment is it did go away. Now, some people are not as fortunate to have that nausea go away naturally. I um, did have that. So I was able to actually get back into full appetite and energy by about week number two after each infusion. And 
So what helped me the most with my nausea was having some form of exercise. And I know that seems counterintuitive, but it stimulates your appetite. It gets you out in fresh air um, and really just the whole effect of having some kind of movement in your body is exactly what it is craving. So that was a huge piece of it. And then the second was a lot of liquid calories. Um, I got really into smoothies and making things with green juices, um, protein powders that were vegan and very um, synthetic free. And this is how I was, I was able to maintain my weight which if I had dipped any lower in weight, I probably wouldn't have been able to receive chemo, which would extremely hurt my chances of survival. survival. So um, the nausea was the first. The second, um, just being a lack of energy. And that is very difficult. I use sleep as my weapon of choice and um, was not ashamed of it, but every day incorporating movement and good nutrition allowed me to really kick that energy into high gear. And I did not have neuropathy, so I did not experience any numbness in my fingers and toes, which is actually a very lucky non-symptom uh, that I experienced. And lastly, hair loss and I had to take Lupron, um, which is a injection that puts your body into a state of menopause to um, help, help your ovaries not shed each month so that I could protect some of the eggs given I wasn't able to freeze. So this um, made me have the worst hot flashes and mood swings. That on top of just feeling shitty already was not ideal, but I was able to manage those to the best of my ability. People talk about physical side effects all day long, but it really takes your mental health to be as strong as possible during this time. And it is something that is lacking in oncology and elsewhere in our entire world, if we're being honest. But I bring it up because uh, it needs to be a focus for every patient to highlight the importance of your mental health during this time and how I counteracted that or helped mitigate some of the negative stories I told myself was through meditation. Um, I had been practicing before I was diagnosed and I made it a daily ritual to have a 15 to 20 minute meditation where I actually just sat in my thoughts. And again, it seems counterintuitive, but it ended up being a massive way for me to befriend some of the scariest things that came up and help tell the stories that I was manifesting that it wasn't true and that I was going to get through this. So I met with a nutritionist who said, the only thing you need to focus on is eating food. I don't really care what you eat, but eat it. And I took a different approach, which I really think was a massive part of my success, which was taking sugar and heavily processed carbs and flours out of my diet. And um, this was a part of my own undertaking, but it was something that my entire family got behind and supported me with, which allowed me to have success and um, stick with it during the course of my six treatments. I, again, was by myself on treatment number six, and I was so proud of myself. I was so proud of what I just endured and what my body just did. And... I had a surprise uh, group of friends at the end of it come meet me and celebrate that final feeling of being done, at least for that time, because like you said, I did not know if I was in remission and the bell was actually like, usually there's a big bell that you ring and they didn't have it because of COVID. So you'll see some of the little shakers my parents brought with them to uh, celebrate my, my last day. But um, in this picture, you'll see there's a little um, saying on the top and it says Superwoman. And you might see my shirt, but I'm wearing a Wonder Woman sports bra. And I just felt like I had that power and strength given the amount of support that my family and friends um, provided me. So I, I really was feeling 
every power of hope in me. I got to see my family. Well, I got to see my friend group for the first time after my treatment had ended. And I gave myself a few weeks to recover and went out to Montauk with about 15 of my closest friends to celebrate. And this picture just speaks for itself. I was in the most beautiful picturesque place. I was wearing a dress and I was considering wearing a wig and was like, nope, I'm just going to own it and be bald. But this time I'll never forget because I got to experience friendship on a physical level for the first time and what happiness really felt like. Um, and it was only a week after that I would then learn with my family by my side that I was in remission and my scan came back clear. I have transitioned from a facade as easily as most people would think transitioning could look. So after treatment, I moved back into the city, into New York. I started work again. I actually got promoted at work very recently after my diet or after I came back. And it felt as though everything was falling back into place. I was in remission. I had friends around me. I was in a big city, but my mental health was not there. And presently, it probably isn't fully there right now. And it's been a year since I was diagnosed. So I struggled with it, but yet having a consistent routine and incorporating things that I learned during my treatment into my day to day was the one part of how I could actually work through this transitory time. And some of those things were following my meditation practice, having movement and eating well as a part of my daily routine, um, making sure I connected with family and friends each day to just give them the lowdown on how I was feeling. And those pieces have not left me currently.